It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. Just like with the Christians, it seems as though that the Muslims are claiming that everything in the Quran is very much perfect, that it's the inspired word of God. And so for this video, what I'm gonna do is respond to the video that is titled Five Scientific Facts That Are Mentioned in the Quran. And so without further hesitation, let us respond to the whole entire video. Scientific facts that were mentioned in the Quran way before they were discovered. The origin of the universe. Before I get any further in my response, I first want to state that obviously I'm not a scientific expert. In fact, most of my scientific knowledge that I have in my head right now is largely based upon public education, which by the way is not the greatest in the United States in comparison to the other countries. However, let's define the terms for the Big Bang and compare the Quran verse to see whether or not it's actually a description of the Big Bang. This comes directly from NASA for Kids, which is pretty perfect for dummies like me. It says, what is the Big Bang? The short answer, the Big Bang is how astronauts explain the way the universe began. It is the idea that the universe began just as a singular point and expanded and stretches to grow as large as it is right now and is still stretching. What's this Big Bang all about? In 1927, an astronomer named George Lamet had a big idea. He said that a very long time ago, the universe started as just a single point. He said the universe stretch and expand to be as big as it is now, and it could keep on stretching. When the universe began, it was just a hot, tiny particles mixed with light and energy. It was nothing like we see now. As everything expanded and took up more space, it cooled down. The tiny particles grouped together. They form atoms. So these atoms grouped together over a ton of them. Atoms came together to form stars and galaxies. The first stars created bigger atoms and groups of atoms. That led to more stars being born. At the same time, galaxies were clashing and grouping together as new stars were being born and dying. Then things like asteroids, comets, planets, and black holes formed. So as you guys can see, the universe as we know it right now started from a singular point, and from that singular point, more or less the universe began to expand and continue to expand, and all the planets and everything else that we know right now started to exist. Now, why do you want to call it God or not is a whole entirely different question. And personally, I would say that since we have no idea what happened before the Big Bang, my personal answer is we don't really know. That's like the scientific answer and to me like the most logical answer when it comes down to this whole entire question on how the universe came to be. However, let's take a look at the verse and what she referenced for the Quran. Have those who disbelieve not consider that the heavens and the earth were a joint entity and we separate them and made the water from every living thing, then why do they not believe? Honestly, when I was just reading that whole entire quotation, I failed to see how exactly was it talking about the Big Bang? Mostly because of the claims that the heavens and the earth were together before things started to format. And that is not true because the Big Bang, like I said earlier, just started out from a singular starting point and from there on out the universe started to expand and continue to expand and the planet started to form. And so if this is the idea of evidence of the Big Bang, is a very lousy type of evidence. Brain anatomy. When it comes down to brain anatomy, the whole entire topic is really complicated. But more or less, the idea is that there are various parts of the brain that actually work for different things. For example, there are some parts of the brain that work for artistic stuff. There are parts of the brain that work for speech. There's parts of the brain that works for sight and everything else. And so, more or less, different parts of the brain work throughout the human body for different types of different activities, thoughts, 
feelings, and sights. So what does the Quran say about this? No, if he does not detest, we will surely drag him by the forelock. Judging from that passage, it is not talking about how the brain works. More or less is saying that someone is just dragging somebody by their hairline. That's it. So, how is this related to people doing the study about how brains work and how every part of the brain do different functions? The prenatal development. Okay guys, I'll try not to laugh during this part because what the Quran says about the fetus and how it develops is just too hilarious guys. Just too hilarious. And certainly, we did not create man from the extract of clay. <laughs> and certainly, we did not create man from the extract of clay. <laughs> then we placed him as a sperm drop and a form logging. Then we made the sperm drop into the clean clock, and we made the clock into a lump of flesh, and we made from the lump bones, and we covered the bones with flesh, then we develop him into another creation. So blesses Allah, the best of creators. Where do I begin with this whole entire passage right here? Because I'm pretty sure that even men back then knew that humans were not made from clay. To explain it to you guys, and yes, it's going to be pretty graphic right here. We know that through intercourse, right? That through the sperm they actually ejaculated into the woman's body. And so, millions of sperms try to, you know, travel towards, like, the egg. And, of course, like, a lot of sperm probably die trying to go to the egg. And once that sperm just fertilized the egg, then, of course, the human, as we know it today, like the fetus, start to develop. Humans are not made from clay. And to suggest that humans are made from clay, it's just utterly ridiculous to me. The sun revolves in its own orbit. The division of the two oceans. The formation of clouds. Let's answer the claims one by one, shall we? Clouds are formed when moist air rises upward, rises, it becomes colder. Eventually, the air can't water vapor in it, and some of the water vapor forms tiny water droplets. When moist air is cool ground, fog is formed in the same way. Clouds form at a wide range of altitudes, from near to the ground to very high in the atmosphere. The appearance of clouds vary a lot, depending on the motives of the air as the clouds are formed. Other important things to observe about clouds are the percentage of the sky they cover, where they are located in the sky, how much of the sky they cover, and the direction of their movement. So what does the Quran say about the formation of clouds? Do you not see that Allah drives clouds? Then he brings them together. Then he makes them to a mass. And you see the rain emerge from within it. And he sends down from the sky mountains of clouds within, which is hail. And he strikes with it whom he wills and averts it from whom he wills. The flash of his lightning almost take away from the eyesight. Maybe it's my secular point of view, but throughout the whole entire passage, not once does it describe the process on how clouds are made. More or less it was saying that God created the clouds. That's about it. It doesn't go to the deep process on how the clouds are formed and how, of course, more or less they are created. And so it doesn't make any sort of sense to use this passage as a way to prove science, because honestly, science cannot really answer to claims of the supernatural. Here is what the Quran says about the separation of waves. Or, they are like darkness with an unfathomable sea, which is covered by waves, upon which are waves, over which are clouds, darkness, some of them upon others. When one puts his hand near in, he can hardly see it. And he to whom Allah has not granted light, for him there is no light. As far as the science goes, it's a bit more uh, nuanced and complicated. While we're given our planet's ocean separate names, in reality there is no border between them, and currents continuously flow between them 
and mix their waters. The Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet at the submost tip of South America. The videos you may have seen online showing two different colored bodies of water drifting alongside each other are actually showcasing light-colored, sitting-rich fresh water from Melty Glacier meeting dark, salty ocean water in the Gulf of Alaska, and over time, currents and eddies cause these to mix too. As far as the sun having its own orbit, that's not really false because for every 230 million years, the sun and the solar system it carries with it makes one orbit around the Milky Way's center. So what does the Quran say about the sun? It is he who created the night and the day and the sun and the moon. All heavenly bodies in an orbit are swimming. That passage in particular does not say the exact process on why the sun has its own orbit. It just says that God creates the day the night, and of course the orbit. It's just a claim. It's proof of a claim and not the actual, you know, evidence of a claim. As a matter of fact, we know through natural processes, right, that the main reason that there is like day and night is because the earth actually rotates. And while the earth is rotating, it shines upon the sun and of course the sun is shining upon the earth. And so it creates this sort of illusion of night and day. And again, it does not require the supernatural. I'm not trying to disprove the idea of God for believers, but like, there's like a lot of different things you could say that is caused by the scientific method that we learn from the scientific method without having to resort to the supernatural. The shape of the mountains, the internal waves and the depths of the ocean. So mountains form when two continental plates collide. Since both plates have similar thickness and weight, neither of them will sink underneath each other. Instead, they crumble and form until the rocks are forced up to form a mountain range. As the plates continue to collide, mountains get taller and taller. Now the Quran says, have we not made the earth a resting place and the mountains out of stakes? This right here is actually a claim that God created the earth and the mountains it is not evidence of the process of how mountains are even formed. These facts were mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago before the science proved them. As you guys can see, the vast majority of claims are not even based upon science. As you can see, a lot of the claims are based upon the ignorance of men that lived a long time ago who have no such scientific knowledge based upon our current day understanding. Now, that's not to say that science is never changing. I'm not saying that. It is true that the science in the past is way different in comparison to what we have today. And so, probably in the future, as we get more and more advanced with discoveries, perhaps we'll probably find something that we don't even know about right now. That said, it is so weird to me that so many different religious people, be it like the Muslims, or the Christian, or the Mormons, or the Scientologists, always state that their book for the whole entire religion is like perfect, there is no errors. When you have this sort of mindset that no holy book is actually, you know, without, you know, perfections, you'll probably, you know, have yourself very disappointed. Because religious books are not meant to be science textbooks. And so, when you try to combine the ideas of science and religious textbooks, at least, especially in the past, they will always tend to clash. And so, I think when it comes down to faith, it's a very separate issue when it comes down to science. Sure, it's entirely possible to believe that the God created everything. I don't really care much about that. However, when you try to say that religious textbooks are scientific textbooks, you're doing yourself a disservice. And so, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.
He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I won't <laughs> trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.